So I want to welcome everybody to the First Coast Free Thought Society Zoom Room. The First Coast Free Thought Society is an organization of individuals who prefer science and reason over religious dogma and fanaticism. We've enjoyed our non-religious community of the Northeast Florida area and beyond since 1998. We are also the proud chapter of the American Humanist Association of Jacksonville. We are in the happy position to celebrate the First Coast Free Thought Society's 25th year. We hope you'll join us at the Olive Garden on Phillips Highway, Monday evening, December 18th at 6.30 p.m. Should be good conversations, a few laughs, some serious conversations, and champagne toasts for all. We look forward to seeing you there. My plan is to be there too. We're on Facebook, X, Meetup, Instagram, and YouTube. We meet socially through our secular Sunday gatherings in the park and our book and movie discussion groups. And uh, by the way, our book group is going to be discussing this book uh, in, in very shortly. So check out our website and you'll learn more about that. This Dr. C books, the most recent book. Um, then there's the Free Thinker newsletter to which we invite your readership, feedback, and submissions. You may learn more at our website, fcfs.org. I, I got a question for the floor. Is anyone here new to the First Coast Free Thought Society? If so, would you mind showing your hand? If not, that's fine. But if you are, I'd love to hear from you. Are you new? Is this is your first time? And if not, how do you generally hear from us? Do you, do you hear from us through our email, through the Facebook, through social media? Uh, Millennia. Millennia's iPad. Unmute yourself, Millennia. You're, you're mute. Oh, how, you got to click, click the unmute button. Yeah, I oh, get it. There you um, go. I heard about uh, this uh, free thought uh, thinkers through meetup group, and I joined the meetup group. Oh, that's good to hear. So I it's my first time, and I really enjoy listening most of the time. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for sharing. Anybody <laughs> else? Any, anybody, you can put your hand down and mute yourself, Melanie. Uh, um, uh, you're, you, uh, anybody else here new to us? Is this your first time? If not, that's fine. That's fantastic. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're all volunteers, yet we do incur some expenses, largely promotion. We have promoted online, on the radio, and in print. And if you know of a viable place for us to promote, please share it with us. We also have some associated costs for our website and fees for regulatory compliance as a 501c3 charitable organization. So if you can see your way clear to offer a membership donation of 20, 50, or any dollar amount, you'll be the reason we're able to continue our public outreach. We're tremendously grateful for all who have become members and made donations. We need you and we appreciate you. We look forward to a provocative lineup of exciting speakers next month. We, on November 20th, we host Mark Potok, formerly of the Southern Poverty Law Center. He is an expert on racism and hate groups. Then on December 18th, we'll meet in person at the Olive Garden on Phillips Highway for our Human Light Celebration. Then on January 15th, 2024, we'll begin the year with our third Free Thought for All. There's no guest speaker, no holds barred, no topic off limits, just us to discuss, to discuss whatever comes to mind. We have several great guests lined up in 2024, including singer-songwriter activist Holly Near, Dr. Adam Rosenblatt, the biology professor at UNF to discuss climate change, Florida State Representative District 13, Angie Nixon, and Seth Andrews, the thinking atheist. So, Sign on to our meetup page, sign up for our newsletter and email announcement at our website. Stay in touch. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to have Dr. Nick Seabrook, 
offer a presentation describing how Florida has long been one of the most gerrymandered states in the nation. Dr. Seabrook is the chair of the political science department at UNF, and he'll share his observation regarding how the sordid practice of district boundary favoritism and other vote manipulation has undermined our democracies. He, his research focuses on the intersection of law and politics in the United States with a particular emphasis on election administration. And here's his book once again, Dr. Nish, it's, it's published by a very reputable publisher, pick it up. I've read it. It's fantastic. It's an easy read and it's very explanatory. His latest book is, like I just said, One Person, One Vote, A Surprising History of Gerrymandering in America, published in 2022 by Pantheon Books. Please use the Zoom hand feature found at the reactions button to raise your hand during a Q&A. Should you prefer, you may message a question via the Zoom chat. Let's mute the mic until it's time to speak. Please know we are recording the presentation for posterity. So a side note, we don't know who or what or whatever might be said during our discussions during the Q&A. We're, we're open to the public and we're pleased to have the public. Sometimes we cringe, sometimes we nod in quiet approval, and sometimes we cheer. So let's begin by appreciating Dr. Seabrook for graciously offering his time, his expertise, and his insights about gerrymandering and more. So Nick, we are all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me this evening in Zoom space to talk about the issue of gerrymandering, something that has kind of been the major focus of my career as an academic. Um, in a minute, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. I have some slides with maps and various other things that I'd like to show you uh, to illustrate some of the stories that I'm going to tell about the history of gerrymandering here in Florida. Um, but first, let me say uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I am an immigrant to the United States. Um, this is why I have the uh, somewhat unusual accent that I do. Uh, I was actually born in the United Kingdom uh, and I first came to the US in 2003, initially as an exchange student. Um, and so I spent a year uh, at college in Albany, New York. And of course, my phone starts ringing right when I begin talking to you. Um, so I spent a year in Albany and there we go. And um, started studying political science uh, and really became fascinated with the American system of government. And so uh, when I graduated, uh, I came back and attended graduate school at the University of Buffalo uh, in Buffalo, New York. And it was there that I became interested in, in gerrymandering. And I've always been kind of fascinated and drawn to the elements of the US political system that are really unique. Uh, things like the Electoral College, for instance, that we use for presidential elections. And um, coming out and, and growing up and being familiar primarily with the British political system, uh, I was shocked to discover that here in the United States, we allow the politicians who will be running in the districts that we use to elect our representatives in government to also be the people who actually draw those districts to begin with. And when I learned that fact, I was flabbergasted because first of all, it's obviously a blatant conflict of interest uh, that the people who will be candidates for those seats are often in many cases the very same people who decide where the boundaries and the lines will be with uh, will be to begin with 
but also because of the potential for manipulation, the potential for shenanigans. And that ultimately is what gerrymandering is. It's the intentional manipulation of legislative district boundaries, the districts that we use to choose our representatives in government in order to achieve some kind of nefarious political aim, whether that's incumbents holding on to power and maintaining their positions in government, insulating themselves against the popular will, uh, whether it's the white majority drawing districts in order to discriminate against racial and ethnic minorities, or whether it's political parties using the drawing of districts to give themselves an edge over their opponents. Okay, I'm going to attempt to share my screen at this point. Uh, I have two monitors in front of me, so hopefully I get the correct one. And... There we go. Hopefully everyone can see the title slide of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, throwing yep. shade, gerrymandering in the sunshine state. So the topic of my book, as Ken mentioned, is not just gerrymandering in Florida, but gerrymandering across the nation and throughout US history. And so if you're interested in learning more about this topic, uh, and uh, it was gratifying to see that some of you already have the book and are planning to discuss it at your book club, but the book makes the, the argument that gerrymandering is ubiquitous as long as you have elections that involve districts. And of course, here in the United States, at all levels of government, federal, state, and local, we elect our representatives in government using districts. Now, the advantage of districts are that the members of the legislature have a specific geographic constituency. They have a set of people whose job it is for them to represent as opposed to a proportional representation system when politicians are much more beholden to a political party than they are to the people. But there are trade-offs involved in choosing a district-based electoral system over a proportional system. And those trade-offs, of course, involve the drawing of districts and the potential for the configuration of those districts to distort the will of the people. A proportional representation system is always going to translate votes into seats in government in a way that is fair and proportional. It's right there in the name. If one political party wins 52% of the vote, they will control 52% of the seats in the legislature. But when outcomes are determined on a district by district basis, this creates a lot more opportunity for there to be bias because the number of seats that each political party controls depends not just upon how many votes they receive, but how those votes are distributed across the districts in the legislature. And the way that gerrymandering works is that the powers that be will configure those districts in a specific way to ensure that their opponents' votes are distributed inefficiently, whereas the votes of their supporters are distributed more efficiently. And that ultimately is the core of the practice of gerrymandering. It is an exercise in configuring the district lines in a way that the votes of your side are more efficient at translating into seats in the legislature than the votes of your opponents. Okay, looks like the slide advancing is working too. So that's good, we're all set. So for more on the practice of gerrymandering and how it has manifested itself throughout US history, you can consult the book, One Person, One Vote. Um, I was, I was fascinated myself when I was researching 
this topic and kind of into the archives, diving back into even the colonial period, just how many stories of gerrymandering there are and how profoundly the practice of gerrymandering has influenced the course of US history. So some of the stories I talk about in the book include the colorful British colonial governor of North Carolina, uh, an individual by the name of George Burrington, uh, who is remembered for, uh, among other things, both assaulting the attorney general and threatening to murder the chief justice of the colony, uh, actions for which he was removed from office by the British crown, but also for putting in place what, at least according to my research, is the first documented gerrymander to occur in North America. I talk about during the colonial period where the famous patriot John, uh, Patrick Henry attempted to use gerrymandering to keep his arch rival, James Madison, out of the first Congress. This was the very Congress in which Madison was responsible for introducing the Bill of Rights. I talk about how Adria Abraham Lincoln used gerrymandering of the boundaries of the US territories in the mid 19th century to boost Republican prospects in the Senate and his own reelection opportunity through the Electoral College. And then I move into the modern era, the 20th century, the one person, one vote revolution of the 1960s, and all of the modern shenanigans that we've seen as gerrymandering has become not just an occasional tool that politicians could use to put their thumb on the scales of democracy, but something that happens every decade in every state um, and with a degree of precision and effectiveness uh, that we really didn't see in these previous periods. With the availability of detailed electoral data, technology, software, computer power, the gerrymanders of the 21st century, uh, at least in my view, represent a far greater threat to democracy than at any prior period in US history. So for my talk today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, covering how gerrymandering has been used uh, throughout Florida history. And then I'm going to finish with the events that have been unfolding over the last few years, uh, both uh, in terms of Florida's congressional districts and the effect that that has had on us here in Northeast Florida as well as the gerrymandering of the Jacksonville City Council districts and the various lawsuits that have been playing out in state and federal court uh, over the last couple of years. So Florida over the last 25 years or so has kind of undergone a political transformation. Most of you probably remember the 2000 election between George W. Bush and Al Gore, where Florida was the swingiest of swing states. The election was decided by a margin of just 537 votes. That was enough to give George W. Bush both the state of Florida and the presidency. And for elections, uh, at least uh, through 2012, Florida was kind of considered to be one of these close states that was competitive, where either Democrats or Republicans could win. And of course, more recently, Florida has come to be considered more of a red state. Uh, Donald Trump won the state of Florida in both 2016 and 2020. And we've seen the state become less and less competitive over the last six or seven years. But for the longest time, Florida was very much a blue state. And uh, I think we probably have at least some people in the audience who remember when Democrats used to dominate Florida politics. It was part of the heavily Democratic solid South that arose following the end of Reconstruction uh, in the wake of the Civil War. Once Reconstruction came to an end, the Democratic Party took control of both the Florida House of Representatives 
and the Florida Senate in the 1876 election. And they did not relinquish control of either chamber until the 1992 election. So a period of almost 120 years in which Democrats enjoyed unbroken control of both chambers of the Florida state legislature. Now, 1876 was also the famous disputed presidential election between the Democratic nominee Samuel J. Tilden and the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. And Florida, in fact, was one of the disputed states in that election. The final results show that Hayes won Florida by less than a thousand votes in 1876. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of allegations of voter intimidation, potential fraud, various election irregularities. And 1876 was also the election that brought the corrupt bargain that installed Hayes in the White House, allegedly in return for Republicans agreeing to the end of Reconstruction, which ushered in the era of Jim Crow and um, the widespread disenfranchisement of African-American voters. And so the African-Americans in Florida who had voted Republican in the wake of the Civil War uh, had led to uh, a significant number of African-American Republicans being elected to both state and national government in Florida between 1865 uh, and 1876. That all came to an end and the Democrats took control of the state of Florida. Uh, and this was not your modern progressive Democratic Party. This was the heavily white, segregationist, and racist Democratic Party of the pre-civil rights era. And it's hard to underestimate just how much of a stranglehold the Democratic Party had on Florida politics for more than a century. So between 1876 and 1992, as I said, Democrats not only controlled uh, both chambers of the Florida legislature uh, in an unbroken streak, but for much of that time, they held not only a majority, but a landslide in those chambers. So for instance, between 1898 and 1928, so a 30 year period, all 32 seats in the Florida Senate were held by Democrats throughout that 30 year period. In that same 30 year period, only two Republicans were elected to the state house of representatives and Florida had only one Republican governor between 18, 1877 and 1987. So that's a period of 110 years. So because gerrymandering is most frequently used to benefit one political party over another in at least a semi-competitive electoral environment, the Democrats really didn't gerrymander all that much during this period because as you've seen, they really didn't need to. Um, when you're winning every single seat in the Senate and all but two seats in the House of Representatives, it doesn't really matter how you draw the district. Almost all white Floridians during this period were Democrats and black voters were effectively disenfranchised until the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. That being said, even during this period, disputes over how Florida's districts should be configured and drawn were a major intra-party point of contention between Democrats. And for many, many decades, it was the Northern contingent of the Florida Democratic Party who were vastly overrepresented in the legislature because of how the districts who were drawn, who used control over redistricting to maintain their stranglehold on Florida politics. And this group of individuals, uh, the 20 or so Democrats from North Florida who for decade after decade fought tooth and nail, not only to prevent African-Americans and Republicans from gaining any kind of electoral foothold in the state of Florida, 
but also to prevent their fellow Democrats in the growing urban centers of Central and South Florida from gaining influence over the legislature as well. And um, they were nicknamed by the Tallahassee Press Corps, the Pork Chop Gang. Uh, and the origin of that name is based on how successfully they were able to use their stranglehold on the legislative process to bring back the bacon to their districts, to secure funding for the smattering of seats in North Florida and in the panhandle that they represented. This is a picture of the pork chop gang from the 1950s. Uh, it's not the greatest uh, photo. Uh, it seems like there was some overexposure uh, going on here. Uh, but I can assure you that the original image is overwhelmingly white as well. This group of individuals from North Florida were effectively the, uh, the cabal that controlled Florida politics for most of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, it was not until the 1960s when both the Federal Voting Rights Act in 1965 uh, and the Supreme Court's one person, one vote rulings. Uh, and of course, the title of my book is a reference to this constitutional principle of one person, one vote. The idea that when it comes to uh, when it comes to districts that elect their voices in government, every citizen's vote should count equally. These rulings brought an end to the practice of malapportionment. Uh, which was something that was used extensively by the pork chop gang in Florida to dramatically overrepresent rural voters in the state legislature. Uh, essentially, the districts that were represented by rural legislators had pretty small populations, whereas the districts that were represented by urban legislators had very large populations, which meant that these rural voters had an outsized influence on what was going on in Tallahassee, an influence that was far disproportional to their actual numbers. But these twin developments in the 1960s, the Voting Rights Act, which ended disenfranchisement and Jim Crow, and ensured that African-American voters were legally protected at the federal level and had the full force and might of the federal government behind their civil rights, and the Supreme Court's one person, one vote rulings effectively broke the stranglehold of the pork chop gang. And beginning in the late 1960s, Florida for the first time would have districts that were drawn based on population and districts in which the rights of minority voters were supposedly, uh, were supposedly protected. And so this brought an end then to the era in which redistricting was largely an intra-party ideological squabble between rural conservative Democrats in North Florida and the more moderate and urban members elsewhere in the state, uh, and instead turned it into a battle over gerrymandering. And this was something that we saw not just in Florida, but across the nation, that when malapportionment came to an end, when states were required to draw all of the districts in their state legislature to equalize populations, this meant that every 10 years when we get new uh, population numbers from the US Census Bureau, all of those districts had to be redrawn in order to remain in compliance with one person, one vote. And politicians, not just in Florida, but across the nation, realized that this presented them with an opportunity to gerrymander, to boost their partisan fortunes, to gerrymander, to ensure that even though the district populations were equal, they could manipulate the lines to help either Democrats or Republicans, depending on the state, to retain their legislative majorities. Uh, incidentally, um, one uh, one other interesting anecdote about the pork chop gang that I uh, discovered during my research, uh, the the leader the leader and kind of spokesperson for the pork chop gang uh, was an individual by the name of Charlie Eugene Johns. 
Uh, and he was a state senator from the city of Stark. Uh, so not all that far away uh, from here. Uh, and he was known for a number of things. Uh, among them was his signature initiative uh, in the state legislature, uh, which was to push for the construction of a portable electric chair that would be powered by a generator uh, and that could be loaded onto a truck and taken around the state to allow for quick fire executions of those convicted of capital crimes. Uh, so uh, Senator Johns apparently was not a fan of due process. Uh, I guess was frustrated that people who were convicted uh, and sentenced to death had the opportunity to pursue things like appeals uh, and uh, and all of that. Uh, and so he felt that if we if we built this mobile election uh, electric electric chair, uh, they could just take it to the courthouse, and once someone was convicted, they could uh, they could strap them in and get the execution over and done with. Uh, tells you a little bit about what kind of character. Uh, both Johns and the Pork Chop Gang uh, were. They were uh, segregationists, they were uh, racists, and also uh, not particularly big fans of the constitutional rights of people, uh, people accused or convicted of crimes. So the developments of the 1960s really changed the face of gerrymandering in Florida. And it went from this uh, kind of battle between the pork shop gang uh, and the rest of the state uh, to uh, ushering in an ugly period of racial gerrymandering. Uh, and this was something that we saw play out, not just in Florida, but across the South, that the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act had kind of broken down the barriers to African-American participation in elections. But the generally white Democrats who controlled the state legislatures across the, uh, across the uh, South realized that they could use gerrymandering to manipulate the districts to prevent these newly enfranchised voters from having a voice in government. Uh, and so in the 1970s, the state legislature put in place redistricting plans that were designed to prevent newly enfranchised African-American voters, as well as the growing Hispanic and Latino populations in South Florida from gaining effective representation in Tallahassee. And though these racially discriminatory maps that were drawn in the early 1970s uh, were challenged in court, they were eventually upheld in a four to three decision by the Florida Supreme Court. And it was at this point that the Sunshine State missed its first opportunity to do something about the problem of gerrymandering while it was still in its infancy. Because the Democratic governor at the time, Ruben Askew, was a reformist. Uh, he was someone who believed in good government, uh, believed in minority representation, and bucked many of his fellow Democratic partisans in pushing for a fair redistricting process in the state of Florida. And he threw his support behind a proposed amendment to the state constitution that would have created an independent redistricting commission. It would have made Florida one of the very first states in the nation to reform the redistricting process, to make it fair and to remove self-interested politicians from the equation. Now this proposal was on the ballot in the 1978 election, but unfortunately, the voters of the state of Florida rejected it by a 53 to 47% margin. So Florida had an opportunity to do something about gerrymandering in the 1970s, but the people were not sufficiently supportive of this amendment uh, to get it into the state constitution. And this was regrettable because it allowed the discriminatory racial gerrymanders of the 1970s to continue throughout the decade, with the result that by 1980, 
there were just five African Americans in the Florida state legislature, and there was just one Latino representative in the state legislature at that time. Ooh. We'll get to that district in a second. Um, so that then brings us to the 1980s. And while there was certainly no less of an appetite to continue the discriminatory gerrymandering practices of the 1970s. And these had involved not just the racist white Democrats in the legislature keep it seeking to keep out racial minorities, but also to continue uh, mm -hmm. to prevent the Republican Party from gaining a foothold in the state. But in the 1980s, seeking to head off potential federal lawsuits, by this point, not only had we seen several rulings by the US Supreme Court that had struck down some of the racial gerrymanders that had occurred in the 1970s, there was also growing discussion in Congress to strengthen the Federal Voting Rights Act in order to provide greater protection to minority voters. Uh, and so uh, it was against this backdrop that the legislature, while continuing not to fully embrace the cause of civil rights, at least conceded that the uh, representation of minority voters in Florida had to improve, otherwise the federal courts were likely to get involved. Uh, and so the 1980s did see additional minority seats being created in both the state House of Representatives and the state Senate, uh, and some progress being made. By the end of the 1980s, there were 10 African Americans and nine Hispanics in the state legislature. Uh, certainly uh, not a situation that, rep that represented fair uh, and equal representation for those groups, uh, but a significant improvement over where the state had been at the end uh, of the of the 1970s. However, even by 1980, the entire congressional delegation of the state of Florida remained white. Uh, it would not be until the early 1990s when we would start to see uh, African Americans and Latino candidates getting elected to national office from the state of Florida. But at the same time, Republican strength in the state had also been growing. More and more white voters had started to turn their back on the Democratic Party. This process kind of begun with Nixon's Southern strategy uh, in the 1968 presidential election. Um, and while Republicans started doing better in national elections in Florida in the 1980s, it took some time for those gains to be manifested at the state level. Uh, but by the time we get to the 1992 election, the Democratic majority in the state Senate had been reduced to just four seats uh, over the Republicans. Uh, so the narrowest that it had been in more than a century. And so the 1990s redistricting was probably the messiest and most contentious uh, that had happened in the state of Florida to this time, because the Democrats that still controlled the state legislature were kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. They were facing this growing Republican momentum in the state. Republicans seemed to be doing better and better uh, in Florida with every election. Their majority in the state legislature was getting narrower and narrower, and they were also facing these mandates from both Congress and the Reagan Department of Justice to boost the representation of racial minorities. And while you might not associate the presidency of Ronald Reagan with a push for civil rights and minority representation, the reason why both the Reagan and later the Bush Departments of Justice kind of made this a major point of emphasis for them was that the drawing of majority minority districts, so districts in which either black voters or Latino voters 
represented a majority of the population was broadly seen as a practice that benefited Republicans. Because these voters tended to support Democrats, the more of them that you could pack into a given district, the more this helped Republicans win in surrounding areas. Uh, and so the 1982 amendments to the Voting Rights Act, which required states to draw more districts that would allow minority voters to elect candidates of their choice, and then the later regulations by the Reagan Department of Justice really pushed and incentivized states to draw more and more districts in which minority voters could get elected. The idea being that this would help Republicans win in surrounding areas. And so this put the Democrats who controlled Florida at the time in an extremely difficult position because they wanted to try and preserve the seats as far as they could for the incumbent white Democrats who were already in the legislature. They wanted to try and prevent the Republicans who were growing in strength from winning the majority, but they also had to satisfy this mandate from both Congress and the Department of Justice that they had to maximize the number of districts from which minority voters would get elected. And it was these tensions and these pressures that led to the creation of the kind of absurd looking district as the one that you can see on the screen here. This is the 21st state Senate district that was drawn by the Democratic state legislature in the early 1990s. And the reason why the district is as bizarrely shaped as it is, is that it was specifically configured to have a majority black population. And so essentially what the, uh, what the state legislature did was to identify all of the precincts in the greater Tampa and Lakeland area that had concentrations of African-American voters and combine them all into the same district. And this was a practice that was going on not just across Florida, but across the nation. The district that would eventually elect Corrine Brown to Congress uh, and would form the centerpiece of the recent litigation regarding Governor Ron DeSantis's gerrymander here in Florida was also born of this same period in history. And so this was kind of a, a double edged sword, if you will, because these types of districts were extraordinarily successful at electing Black and Latino candidates, both to Congress and the state legislature. The 1992 election saw Florida send its first Black members of Congress to Washington since Reconstruction. Um, it also saw significant gains for Latino voters in South Florida, who had been shut out of political power for many decades as well. But at the same time, when large numbers of black Democrats are packed into districts like these, it allows Republican candidates to essentially clean up in the surrounding areas. And so the 1992 redistricting both served as the uh, transformation of the influence of minority voters here in Florida saw many, many more minorities elected both to Tallahassee and to Washington, but it also finally uh, sounded the death knell for the Florida Democratic Party's unbroken streak of control. The Democrats were kind of stymied in their ability to effectively gerrymander on a partisan basis because of these pressures that they felt uh, from Republicans in Washington and from federal law and the constitution. And as a result, they eventually lost control of the state Senate in the 1994 election, the state House of Representatives in the 1996 election, and of course the governorship in the 1998 election when Jeb Bush 
uh, was elected as governor, uh, having lost extremely narrowly uh, to Lawton Childs, uh, the incumbent, in 1994. That all happened in the 1990s. The Democratic Party has not been able to regain control of any of those institutions to the present day. 1994 was the last time there was a Democratic majority in the Senate. 1996 was the last time there was a Democratic majority in the State House. And 1998 was the last time we had a Democrat in the governor's mansion in Tallahassee. Because just as gerrymandering had been a tool of the pork chop gang to maintain the control of the kind of racist, white, segregationist, rural contingent of the Florida Democratic Party, just as gerrymandering had been used by Democrats both to keep uh, African Americans and Latinos out of office in the 70s and 80s and try and head off the growing Republican strength uh, in the state. Well, now the boot was on the other foot. And for the last three decades, gerrymandering has been a tool that the Republican majority has used to maintain their stranglehold on state government. And this was seen in the 2000s. We saw this again in the 2010s. And we saw it most recently in 2021. Uh, with the effort by Governor Ron DeSantis to gerrymander Florida's districts to send as many Republicans to Washington as possible. And I think this illustrates a point about gerrymandering that I make over and over again in the book. And that is that gerrymandering is not something that has ever really been associated with one political party or the other. Gerrymandering is something that has always been situational. And Democrats have taken advantage of it when they have both the opportunity and the incentives to manipulate the districts. But so too have Republicans taken advantage of it when they have found themselves with those opportunities and those incentives. And this is what makes gerrymandering a particularly challenging problem to fix, because everyone wants to reform redistricting while they're losing, but no one wants to do it while they're winning. And we've seen this here in the state of Florida. Prior to 2000, almost all of the momentum for fixing gerrymandering in Florida had been coming from Republicans. Since 2000, almost all of the momentum for fixing gerrymandering in Florida has been coming from Democrats. And we've seen this uh, across the nation, that support for redistricting reform is situational. And um, when I say support, I mean support from incumbent politicians, those uh, who are benefiting from this practice, because the polling evidence has been pretty consistent on this point that voters do not like gerrymandering. Democrats don't like it. Republicans don't like it. Independents don't like it. But when the people who are benefiting the most from gerrymandering are also the ones who control the levers of power, it becomes especially difficult to reform the system. Unless, like here in Florida, you have access to direct democracy, where the people have the ability to amend the state constitution directly. To illustrate just how extensively the GOP was able to gerrymander Florida's districts uh, after the 2000 census, uh, the map that uh, is up on the slide right now uh, essentially shows how the presidential votes for George W. Bush and Al Gore were distributed across the set of Florida House districts that were drawn by the GOP after that election. And so you can see this essentially was an election where the popular vote between Bush and Gore was an almost exact tie. Statewide, Bush won 48.8% of the vote. Gore also won 48.8% of the vote. And yet, 
that equally divided popular vote was distributed in a way where George W. Bush won 75 of Florida's House of Representatives districts and Al Gore won only 45 of those districts. So a tied election led to a 30 seat discrepancy between how those votes were distributed across the state. Kind of illustrating the point that I made earlier that gerrymandering is all about manipulating the efficiency of votes and making sure that your opponent's votes are packed into as many districts uh, where they win large majorities as possible, whereas your voters are distributed more efficiently across geographic space. So that kind of is how the practice of gerrymandering played out uh, over the 20th century here in Florida. And once it became clear that the Republican Party was now going to be using this tool to gerrymander themselves into effectively permanent control of the state legislature, there was renewed momentum among Democrats and progressives to try and reform the system by which we draw districts here in Florida. And it was this effort following the 2000 Republican gerrymander that ultimately led to the fair districts amendments to the state constitution. The 2010 election was not generally a very good one for Democrats, either across the nation or here in Florida. Um, Democrats lost something like 60, 70 odd seats in, in the House of Representatives, lost control of the Senate, and uh, also Rick Scott won the gubernatorial election here in Florida. But the one bright spot uh, in the 2010 election was that the fair districts amendments were on the ballot. And I have the text of those amendments here on the screen. These were amendments that were designed to make gerrymandering illegal in the state of Florida, both the kind of egregious racial gerrymandering that we'd seen back in the 1970s and 1980s, and also the kind of partisan gerrymandering that the Republicans had engaged in in 2000. The amendment says that districts or districting plans may not be drawn to favor or disfavor an incumbent or political party, so no partisan gerrymandering. It also says that districts shall not be drawn to deny racial or language minorities the equal opportunity to participate in the political process and elect representatives of their choice. That language effectively mirrors what is found in the 1965 Federal Voting Rights Act and its 1982 amendments. The very legislation that led to the creation of majority minority districts that sent minority elected officials to both Tallahassee and Washington. It also talks about how di districts must be contiguous i.e. all of the different parts of a district must be connected to one another. And unless otherwise required, districts must be compact, as equal in population as feasible, and where feasible must make use of existing city, county, and geographical boundaries. Both of these amendments to the state constitution were approved by large majorities of Florida voters in the 2010 election. Amendment five, which applied these standards to the drawing of state legislative districts, received 62.59% support in that election. Amendment six, which extended it to congressional districts, received 62.93% uh, support. And as I said, uh, these were uh, initiatives that were um, placed on the ballot in 2010 through citizen petition. So not by politicians, not by the Constitutional Review Commission, as had happened with the 1978 amendment, but by 
activists going out there, collecting signatures and getting enough support to allow the people of Florida to vote for these constitutional amendments that prohibited any gerrymandering, racial or partisan, here in the state of Florida. But of course, 2010 was not the end of gerrymandering in Florida. Unfortunately, these constitutional amendments were not effective enough to prevent Florida's gerrymandering problem from continuing. Because, and um, you'll have to believe me when I say that I was uh, making this point at the time, uh, but I myself was somewhat skeptical uh, about these amendments back in 2010. So I actually moved to Florida in August of 2010, actually July of 2010, uh, which was when I was hired as an assistant professor here at UNF. And so um, this debate was one of the kind of first uh, things that happened during my career as a professor. And I was somewhat skeptical as to whether these amendments would actually be effective at ending gerrymandering, largely because they left the state legislature in control of the process. And this is something that I talk about quite a bit in the conclusion to my book, where I go through various different proposed solutions to the problem of gerrymandering, and try to identify those that have been the most effective. Uh, and to discuss this, I kind of use the metaphor uh, of gerrymandering being kind of like putting the foxes in control of guarding the hen house. Uh, the problem with the Fair District's amendments is that they basically left the foxes in control of guarding the hen house, but wrote them a very strongly worded letter telling them that they weren't allowed to eat any of the chickens. Um, and this was an issue because you can tell the foxes that they're guarding the hen house and they're not supposed to eat the chickens, but it is in the nature of the foxes to not obey those instructions. And so too, it is in the nature of politicians to do whatever they can first to obtain and then to hold on to power. The only enforcement mechanism for the Fair District's amendments is to file a lawsuit and hope that you can convince a judge, uh, convince an appeals court, convince the Florida Supreme Court that a constitutional violation has actually taken place. And as we shall see, relying on the courts to fix our broken democracy is never going to be an effective solution for the problem of gerrymandering. For a number of years after the Fair District Amendments were put in place, there were a series of long running lawsuits and legal battles over gerrymandering here in Florida, because once the Fair District Amendments were put in place, we were relying on the goodwill of the Republicans in the state legislature and our newly elected governor, Rick Scott, to actually follow and obey them in practice. And so what they did was that in public, they said that they were following the constitution, whereas in private, they had basically turned over the entire redistricting process to professional Republican political operatives and redistricting experts. So the only effect that the Fair District's amendments had was that it forced the incumbent politicians to do their gerrymandering in private as opposed to out there in the open. But the result was effectively the same. We had another Republican gerrymander and it was not until many years later during a lawsuit that the full extent of this skullduggery ultimately came to light. Eventually, the Florida Supreme Court did enforce the Fair District's amendments against a district that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, 
because it was the district that was represented uh, in the 2010s and uh, up until uh, around about 2016 uh, by former representative and more recently convicted felon Kareen Brown, uh, who ultimately would lose control of this seat uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, the more recent elections. But this was another district that had been drawn specifically both to pack as many black voters as possible into a seat that would elect an African-American to Congress while simultaneously allowing Republican candidates to win all of the surrounding seats. Uh, and so in 2015, note we are now five years removed from the Fair District's amendments, and we have already had two and eventually three elections that were held under these illegally gerrymandered boundaries. But in 2015, the Florida Supreme Court stepped in and said, this is a violation of the state constitution. This district and several others elsewhere in the state were clearly drawn both to favor Republicans and also to pack minority voters into a district uh, in a way that was not necessary to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. This district was struck down in, uh, in 2015. Eventually, there was a new congressional map, but that map did not take effect until the 2018 election. So note here the drawbacks of the Fair District's Amendment approach. You have written into the state constitution that it is illegal to engage in both partisan and racial gerrymandering. The state legislature nevertheless went ahead and engaged in both, but it took six years and three elections for the case to make its way through the state court system to finally get a ruling that those districts were unconstitutional. More recently, uh, and now we'll turn our attention to what has been happening here in Florida uh, relating to gerrymandering in the last few years, because uh, the result of that lawsuit in 2015 and the decision of the state Supreme Court was that the North-South district that was on the previous slide was redrawn to create a district that was not majority African-American, but nevertheless was effective at allowing African-American voters in North Florida to send a representative to Congress. Uh, and this was the East to West version of Florida's fifth district uh, that uh, I, and I'm sure many of you lived in uh, at least until uh, Governor DeSantis got his hands on it a few years ago. This was a district that was drawn to combine black voters, both here in Jacksonville, in the city of Tallahassee, but also in many of the ancestrally black communities in uh, North Florida along the Georgia border. This was the location of the highest concentration of plantations in the state of Florida during slavery. It was the area where large numbers of uh, free African-Americans continued to live uh, after the Civil War. And it was a, the area where large numbers of newly enfranchised black voters finally got the opportunity to participate in elections after the civil rights movement. But then for decade after decade, these black voters were systematically shut out of the ability to elect a member of Congress, particularly those uh, in places like Baker, Columbia, uh, Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, and Gadsden counties, but also Black voters in and around Tallahassee as well. This district, which was ordered by the state Supreme Court in 2015, finally allowed the Black communities of North Florida to send a representative to Congress. But it was this district that was targeted by Governor DeSantis after the 2020 census and famously dismantled in order to ensure that more Republicans would get elected 
from North and Northeast Florida. So the mo most recent redistricting uh, saw both the state Senate and the state House of Representatives draw congressional plans that preserved uh, the North Florida black performing district that we saw on the previous slide. But Governor DeSantis entered the redistricting process with the goal of sending as many Republicans as possible to Congress. And so he not only vetoed the plan that the legislature had, had enacted, um, he also vetoed the compromise proposal that you can see below, uh, which would have preserved uh, a, an African-American district uh, here in North Florida, uh, but it would have been centered uh, around the city of Jacksonville, and it would only have represented those communities here in Northeast Florida. That was not enough for the governor. He instead preferred the map that you can see at the top here, which basically split the city of Jacksonville in half along the St. John's River, creating two uh, heavily Republican districts, uh, one to the north and west, and one to the south and east. Uh, and this uh, achieved the governor's goal of ensuring that no Democrats would be elected to Congress from anywhere north of Orlando. It's this map and specifically these districts that have been the subject of recent litigation. And in fact, we are still not sure what the North Florida congressional map will look like for the 2024 election. Uh, around about a, a month ago, uh, a lower court state judge ruled that the governor's plan was a violation of the fair districts amendments essentially said that the former district would need to be reinstated, but that decision is currently on appeal. At some point over the next few months, we will likely have a ruling that will determine whether African American voters in North Florida even get any voice in Congress, let alone the district that was specifically tailored to represent their interests. At the same time, there's also a federal lawsuit that's playing out about this district as well, arguing that Governor DeSantis and the legislature engaged in intentional racial discrimination in violation of the 14th and 15th amendments to the constitution. That standard, that using redistricting to intentionally target minority voters and reduce their opportunity to elect members uh, of, uh, of either state or local legislatures or Congress is the focus of another lawsuit, which had to do with the uh, city council districts here in Florida. Um, and I wanna make sure I leave uh, some time for questions. So uh, I will quickly kind of finish off the, the recent developments here and then uh, give people an opportunity to to ask whatever questions they might have. Uh, but uh, just to round off the, the previous topic here, uh, Governor DeSantis's gerrymander was spectacularly successful. This is one of the most egregious partisan gerrymanders that I have ever seen. Now, Florida is certainly a more Republican state than it was a decade ago, but as a result of this gerrymander, in the 2022 election, Florida's delegation to the House of Representatives consisted of 20 Republicans and only eight Democrats. Uh, so uh, a, an extremely lopsided partisan breakdown. It was drawn in such a way as to minimize the number of Democrats, packing them into eight safe districts. Uh, and to draw as many districts as possible that were moderately Republican uh, to allow them to win by narrower margins. Okay. I wanna finish quickly by kind of bringing this all back to what's been going on here in Jacksonville because redistricting and gerrymandering have been uh, a, a source of controversy and contention, not just in Tallahassee, not just when it comes to Florida's representatives 
uh, in the US Congress, but also in our city council as well. And uh, I could spend another two hours talking about the history of gerrymandering and redistricting here in Jacksonville and how many of the uh, kind of ugly partisan and, and racial manipulation of districts that we've seen writ large in the state of Florida has also been occurring uh, at the micro level here in Jacksonville with our city council. Uh, but what I will say is that for many decades, the city council approached redistricting here in Jacksonville with two goals, to ensure that Republicans maintained a majority of city council seats and to ensure that black populations here in Jacksonville were packed into only four districts, that you had four districts with heavily black populations and all of the rest of the districts were overwhelmingly white and generally fairly heavily Republican as well. At the start of uh, 2021, the, uh, the general counsel for the city of Jacksonville sent a memorandum to the members of the council who were engaged in the drawing of districts and told them that this practice was a violation of the constitution told them that they could not continue to pack black voters into a few districts, thus reducing their ability to influence anything outside of those, poor, uh, those four packed seats. And those are districts seven, eight, nine, and 10, uh, which you may notice are some of the most bizarrely and um, distortedly shaped districts on the city council map. So the city's own lawyers had informed them that Jacksonville had been engaging in racial gerrymandering for decades, that the way that the districts were currently drawn to pack black voters into four districts was a violation of the constitution, uh, and that they could face significant legal trouble if they were continue, uh, to continue to do this. Um, and I'm sure I don't need a spoiler alert, what the city council proceeded to do was exactly the same kind of racial gerrymandering that Florida had been engaging in and that Jacksonville had been engaging in for decade after decade after decade. You can see from uh, this final map that I will present to you this evening how this manifested itself. Uh, in the drawing of Jacksonville's city council districts. Now, Jacksonville, like most major cities in the United States, has a significant level of uh, residential segregation when it comes to uh, minority populations. That uh, as a result of white flight, uh, as a result of redlining, discriminatory zoning, and various other types of practices throughout the second half of the 20th century, Jacksonville has neighborhoods that are identifiably African-American and neighborhoods that are much more overwhelmingly white. And this is a pattern that we see reflected in major cities across the United States, that they are residentially segregated which makes minority voters an easy target for gerrymandering. Because if you put them all into a few supermajority districts, yes, those districts will elect African-Americans to the city council, but it also dilutes their ability to have an effective influence on the outcome of elections overall. You can see from the map how the members of the city council systematically packed the the um, the uh, the precincts in the city that had uh, the most black voters into just four districts, and all of the rest of the map, particularly once you get out across the river into the south side and towards the beaches, were districts that were overwhelmingly white. And in a lawsuit last year a federal judge and appointee of George W. Bush said that this was a violation of the constitution. And as a result, Jacksonville had to redraw all of its city council districts, which will be used, uh, or which were used for the, uh, for the elections uh, earlier this year. So 
if there's one takeaway, and I hope that this has uh, kind of been clear, not just from the history of gerrymandering here in Florida, but also, as I talk about in the book, throughout American history and across the nation, the fundamental point is that politicians cannot be trusted to draw districts. You can place whatever legal constraints you want in their path, and they will still do whatever they can to manipulate the drawing of districts to serve their own political and personal ends. The state of Florida amended its constitution in 2010 to make racial and partisan gerrymandering illegal. And what has followed is two consecutive decades of racial and partisan gerrymandering. The lawyers for the city of Jacksonville informed the members of the city council in a memo that their current districts violated the federal constitution and that if they did not take steps to correct that, they would continue to be in violation of the federal constitution. And they went ahead and made as few changes to those districts as they conceivably could. The reason being the incumbent members of the state legislature wanted to keep their seats. The governor of the state wanted to boost Republican prospects in Congress. And the incumbent members of the city council all wanted to, to keep their seats as well. So they made as few changes to the districts as they possibly could. You can put whatever legal constraints, constitutional constraints in the way of politicians. If they are allowed to control the drawing of their own districts, there will inevitably always be gerrymandering, which is why the model that Florida almost adopted back in 1978 which failed by a 53 to 47 vote, an independent redistricting commission is the only way to effectively fix gerrymandering. And the more independent and the more isolated and from political influence that commission is, the better it is able to perform that job. As far as we can, we need to remove politics from the equation and incidentally, this is what just about every other nation that uses districts for their elections has done. I talked about how uh, when I moved to the US from the UK, I was shocked at how redistricting was accomplished here. That's because the United Kingdom, and in fact, pretty much all of the nations of the British Commonwealth created independent redistricting commissions more than a hundred years ago to draw all of the, the districts for their legislatures. Across Europe, across South America, across Asia, every nation that uses districts for elections has figured out that you cannot let politicians control the drawing of those districts. The United States is pretty much the only nation that continues to allow this kind of rampant gerrymandering to occur. When you have independent redistricting, you have elections that are competitive. You have districts that provide a genuine choice between competing visions for the state, competing visions for the city, competing visions for the nation. You have an opportunity for politicians not to control and choose their voters, but for voters to choose their politicians. And this is ultimately how democracy is supposed to function. So that is kind of the takeaway that I took from my three, four year odyssey into researching and writing about the history of gerrymandering. But it's something that you don't need to dive into that history to understand. All you have to do is look at what has happened here in Florida and here in Jacksonville over the last few years to understand that the fundamental problem with our democracy is that we are allowing the politicians to draw the districts rather than returning that power to the people. And uh, with that, I will uh, conclude my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. Oh, we've got, we've got a lot of questions and I appreciate that. I appreciate everything you just said. And I, I can't think of a, a, another author who described their book more succinctly than you did just now. You, you went through it in 100% in, 
gave us an, an understanding of what you're trying to describe in your book, uh, which I have here, um, which I'm going to hold up one more time. Uh, uh, there, 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 you have done a great job in an hour's time. And I'm going to, I know, I, Richard, I, I've got a lot of questions, uh, but uh, let's start with Richard. Okay, I'm actually, um, I served in the embassy in London uh, 30 years ago. I know a reasonable amount of British, about British history. Are there any lessons that we can take from the rotten boroughs situation in Britain about two centuries ago when they had uh, these, these, these uh, districts that in which votes didn't really matter and the same uh, members of parliament were sent every, every election? Uh, what was the driver to change that? And, and is there anything we could learn from that uh, process? Thanks, Richard. That's a great question. And actually, you've uh, you've anticipated the connection that I make in the book, which is that the the American tradition of gerrymandering kind of traces back to the to the centuries long British tradition of the the rotten borough, and actually got kind of imported to the United States during the colonial era when some of the British governors discovered that gerrymandering was something that they could use to uh, to. Uh, control some of their more unruly uh, con con colonists who they they wanted to uh, prevent from from gaining influence. Um, so I, I would I would characterize what the UK did to fix that as a two step process, um, where the US has completed the first step, but we haven't quite gotten around to the second step yet. Um, so the first step was that in the uh, early to mid nineteenth century. Uh, the uh, the uh, UK Parliament did something similar to what happened here in the US in the 1960s, which was they said that uh, all of the parliamentary constituencies had to have approximately equal populations. Uh, and so that eliminated the, the widespread malapportionment where you had some members who were elected by a handful of voters and others who were elected by thousands, hundreds of thousands potentially uh, of constituents. But then in the early 20th century, they took the second step, which was to create an independent commission. It's called the Boundary Commission uh, in the UK to take the power to draw those districts away from, from parliament uh, and put it in a, an independent body that wasn't beholden to elected politicians. And that's kind of the, the, the second stage that we've uh, that we've had trouble with here in, in, in the US. And I think a big part of that is, is federalism. The fact that um, because redistricting is something that's done here at the state level, uh, you can't just have Congress pass a law which says that every state has to have an independent commission. Uh, you could do that for congressional elections. Uh, and in fact, that was one of the components of the, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that uh, that has been debated in Congress uh, during during the Biden administration. Uh, ultimately, didn't didn't become law, but we're we're effectively relying on all of the fifty individual states to arrive at their own solution. And some states have uh, California, uh, Michigan, Colorado, uh, all have created independent citizens redistricting commissions over the, over the last decade or so. Uh, but because you have to kind of do things state by state by state, it's been a lot more challenging to accomplish that kind of second stage in in the reform. Thank you. Well, thank you for the great, great question. Great answer. Uh, Clayton, your, your turn. Ah, cool. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Seaberg, again, for speaking for us. We all appreciate it. Um, my question is, if if these independent commissions are the main solution you've pointed out, what are what are some of the main obstacles that would get in the way of forming them, and what would you what would you advocate that to be done about it? So I would say the 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 main obstacle is the the incumbent politicians themselves. So a lot in a lot of states, the only way that you can potentially change the state constitution or pass a law to create an independent commission is to convince the state legislature to do so. And the members of the state legislature are the people who have the strongest incentive not to fix the system because they are the ones that are currently benefiting from it. And so over the last 
couple of decades and even more so in the last decade, quite a lot of states have created commissions. But generally, the states where that has been effective are states that have some kind of direct democracy that allow citizens to amend the Constitution directly without having to go through the state legislature by collecting signatures and putting an initiative on the ballot. And that is an option for us here in Florida. If there is a sufficiently organized and well-funded movement, we can put an initiative on the ballot to create a, an independent commission here in, here in Florida. It's just a matter of the, the organization and the political will and, and the money to be, able, to be able to do so. But the states where that has happened have almost exclusively been states where you have direct democracy, where you have citizen initiatives. There's been a lot less progress in other states simply because the um, the members of the, the state legislature, the ones who would have to do this, have the, the strongest incentives not to. Okay, so I guess maybe I'll just ask just one tiny follow-up to that. Uh, so then if if the main issue, I guess, is that, you know, there's the populace themselves needing to do something, needing to organize and things of this nature. Um, it, from your knowledge of how, uh, I guess, these types of movements develop, like how long does it usually take or like is it is it practical or even feasible for this to happen? It's a good question. Um... So I've talked about how Florida is one of the most gerrymandered states in the nation. Um, probably the most gerrymandered state is the state of Wisconsin. Um, excuse me. And back in, I think, October of last year, um, I was giving a talk on a similar subject uh, in Madison, and I, I was asked a very similar question. Like, what is what is even the roadmap for fixing the state of Wisconsin. And the answer I gave was that first, you need to get a majority of reformers on the state Supreme Court. And in Wisconsin, that meant that the, the progressive candidate had to win the state Supreme Court election earlier this year. That happened. Step two, you need to get the state Supreme Court to put in place at least a map where progressive reformers can have a plausible opportunity to win a majority. That may still happen in Wisconsin. And at that point, you then have to convince that majority to take action to, uh, to fix gerrymandering, either by uh, proposing an amendment to the state constitution or at the very least passing legislation to create a commission. So you're right, it's, it's kind of a multi-stage process. Uh, and it almost involves kind of temporarily fixing gerrymandering in order to get the political opportunity to permanently fix it. Uh, so honestly, I, I think the main thing is that this needs to be more of an issue that that people talk about uh, and which candidates talk about and campaign on. Part of the problem is that we get redistricting after each census and everyone's paying attention to gerrymandering. And then it goes away and it doesn't get talked about until until the next decade. Meanwhile, the effects of that are continuing to play out and are continuing to undermine democracy in all of the, the intervening years. And that ultimately was why was why I wrote the book, uh, to try and bring greater attention to this and hopefully to make it something that people pressure politicians to take action on. All right. Well. Great answer, great question. Thank you so much, Fred. What what you what's your question? My my, my question is about the um, about how the uh, the bodies that would be the independent bodies that would uh, do the boundaries that how they how they remain independent and not like just the appointed by someone saying, "Hey, you're my good buddy. You're going to vote my way, right?" Mm -hmm. So they're I just you know um, how's it that they're selected so that they remain truly independent and not just a tool of with your parties in, in, in charge. So you, I, I think you you're you kind of hit the nail on the head there in that this has been something that has been a problem, that there have been commissions created that are supposedly independent 
Um, this happened in, in Ohio where they're independent in name only because yes, it's the independent commission that's doing redistricting, not the politicians, but the politicians are able to influence who gets on the commission. And so it's effectively the same thing. And so uh, in the conclusion of the uh, of the book, I recommend the California Citizens Redistricting Commission as kind of the model approach here, because there the, um, the membership of that commission is essentially selected at random. Um, so any any interested citizen in the state of California can apply to be a member of the Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, they have to kind of submit a resume and uh, a couple of letters of recommendation. Um, but ultimately, the membership of the commission, the people who actually draw the districts, is determined at random. And it's balanced, so you have an equal number of registered Democrats, registered Republicans, and registered independents who serve on the commission. And that, I think, is really the only way to do it. Unless it's done randomly, you're never going to be able to guarantee that, that there won't be shenanigans or influence or, or that kind of thing. Um, and that California citizens approach has since been adopted by both Michigan and Colorado as well. And I think it's been enormously successful. So that is what that I think is is the solution to it, that uh, you have regular regular voters be the ones who do this. And you have some kind of random selection method so that no one is able to to game the process. That sounds, that sounds great. Well, it, it, you know, uh, Nick, is the reason we need lines archaic? That's that's an interesting question. Um, so. Yeah. I kind of talked briefly at the beginning about what the logic behind this is that you have when you have a politician who is connected to a constituency, they're able to provide better representation to those citizens when those people are not just one among a sea of people in a proportional representation system that you have kind of that personal connection. Uh, you have members of the legislature or whatever who advance the best interests of their communities. Now, certainly when it comes to Congress, I would say your, your point is correct, that it's archaic. When you have districts that elect members of Congress that have seven, eight, 900,000 people in them, any semblance of that kind of personal um, representational connection is probably is probably lost. Maybe you could make a stronger argument for it in, say, the State House of Representatives, where you have, what, 100 and 110, 120 districts. Their population is, is a lot smaller. Um, but I think you could probably make a strong argument that both for Congress and for the State Senate, uh, that, that it is archaic and that perhaps a more proportional system would be uh, would be would be better, but it's it's also it's also a tradition, and people like to know who their representative in in government is. They like to know that they they have a problem with the VA, or uh, if they have a problem with some agency, that there's there's someone who is their representative who they can they can call and uh, and who can help them fix it. And there, there's certainly a trade off. Um, my preference would be for for independent citizens commissions, but I would acknowledge that proportional representation is a solution to this problem, uh, although not really one that uh, I think is as likely to be to be adopted here in the U.S. Simply because we have this tradition of uh, of knowing who our representatives are uh, and of having individual districts that represent, or at least. Uh, supposedly represent communities. Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, David. You're you're up. Okay, I was just uh, going to add something to what uh, Nick said, and I think he's right. The tradition in the United States that you have districts is really, really strong. But there are some countries around the world. I'm thinking specifically of Germany, Mexico, and Japan 
that have a combination of representation by district and proportional representation. So for example, in Germany, which is my preferred system, when you vote for parliament, you vote twice. You vote for a representative from your district and you vote for your preferred party. So you might vote for somebody from the purple party as your choice to represent your district, but you could still vote for the yellow party on the national level. And it's possible your purple party person won't win, but you'll still get representation uh, at the national level because your party got an extra seat. So you can have a system that has some proportional representation and still have some district representation. Uh, again, I, that's my preferred system, but I think Nick is right that it would be very, very hard to get that kind of thing uh, through because we do have a really, really strong uh, tradition of uh, district representation. Right. Nick, care to comment? He's agreeing with you. <laughs> I am. That that Schwan Baird guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. told you. I told you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's go to Richard. Richard. Yeah, just a comment. Um, I uh, went to college at William Mary in Virginia, and I you know, knew a lot about sort of early colonial politics in the colony of Virginia. Uh, one of my favorite uh, political traditions that came out of Virginia was uh, the candidates would get a, a a keg of rum and put it at the polling station. It was called Bumbo, the name of this type of rum. And so the campaigning was called Swilling the Planters with Bumbo. Um, I'm not sure we progressed that far. Okay. That's a comment? Uh, Nick, comment. Yeah. Nick, care to comment on the comment? I have nothing to say to that. Okay. <laughs> All right. You want to clarify, Rich, or are you okay? No, I'm fine with that. I was just uh, making the observation that our politics has had issues from the very beginning. Okay. All right. So, Nick, we, you talk about the politicians, and you talk about the politicians drawing the lines, and you talk about politicians being in charge, and the politicians are the ones, if they're in charge, they love gerrymandering. And if they're not in charge, if they're not in power, as we say, they don't like it. All right. So a politician or wannabe politician will rally against gerrymandering until they get elected. This is in your book. You've talked about it tonight. So my question is, what's the difference between a politician who is representative in quotes of the people and the people. Well, I think, I think you're right that part of the problem here is the types of people who go into politics are not necessarily the types of people who would make the best representatives that, um, People go into politics because they're ambitious and they're interested in power rather than, and this is kind of painting with a broad brush. This certainly isn't true of, uh, of everyone, but I do think that the, the type of, of person who, who goes into politics as a career is perhaps more susceptible to those kinds of, of incentives. And certainly it's, I, I saw this across my research. Uh, one example, for instance, um, so both both governors Cuomo of the state of New York, so Mario Cuomo and uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, kind of campaigned against gerrymandering when they ran for office and kind of positioned themselves as these reformers, uh, these kind of men of the people. Uh, and then both ultimately reneged on those promises and ended up embracing and supporting the decade after decade gerrymandering that the the state legislature had been had been engaging in. I think the important thing and the thing that can happen if this becomes something that people ask candidates about and which gets discussed during elections is that 
make them promise that they're not going to gerrymander at the very least. At the very least, make them say that they're not going to do it and then go back on it rather than kind of conceal their intentions when they run and turning into just another politician while while they're in office. And um, this kind of goes back to um, to Clayton's question earlier. New York is one of the very few states where redistricting, or at least some redistricting reform has been done by convincing the legislature. And the way they were able to do it was by getting candidates for all of the elected positions across the state of New York to sign a pledge that they would support the creation of an independent redistricting commission. And, and they did this, I think it was the 2014 election. I talk about it in the chapter on, on New York uh, in the book, uh, but because New York doesn't have direct democracy, they couldn't collect signatures and put something on the ballot. So they placed as much electoral pressure on people running for office as they could. They asked them about it. They tried to recruit candidates to sign this pledge. And ultimately, it was enough. You got a majority of the New York legislature elected that supported the creation of, of a commission. Now, um, it was an entirely ineffective commission, but nevertheless, they were able to, to do it. And so I think that's that's the mechanism. Um, get candidates on the record when they're running that they're going to support redistricting reform or they're going to oppose gerrymandering, it becomes more easy to pressure them later down the road if you have them on record. Uh -huh. Okay. Any, 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 thank you for that. Are there other questions, comments? Because if not, I got, I have another question. I have another comment, another question, but I, I'm interested in, in, in learning more about what else is happening beyond just gerrymandering and are you writing another book that's going to describe beyond gerrymandering because gerrymandering is drawing lines and districting lines but there are you talk in your book at length about gerrymandering being the manipulation of votes so how else are we manipulating votes so you asked about what my next project is. Yes, um, I'm very interested. I, so I have thought about perhaps writing a book about the history of the Electoral College. This kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning about my interest is drawn to those elements of the U.S. political system that are kind of unique and that you don't really find elsewhere in the world. And I think the Electoral College is, speaking of things that are archaic, uh, is both um, something that is uniquely American, but also is a, a major obstacle to effective democracy when it comes to presidential elections, not just when you get elections like 2000 or 2016, when a candidate wins the majority of the the popular votes, but but loses the electoral votes, but because of what it does to our campaigns as well, that uh, effectively it limits candidates to campaigning only in a handful of swing states that get all of the visits, that get all of the money, that get all of the advertising. Um, I experienced this when I moved from New York to Florida in 2010. So I was in New York during the 2008 election. I don't think I saw a single presidential campaign ad on TV during that <laughs> campaign. Um, I was in Florida in 2012. I don't I don't think I saw a single commercial commercial that wasn't a political campaign ad during the 2012 election, because, of course, New York is a state that no one cares about. It's always going to be Democratic. Florida and a handful of other states, less than 10 are basically going to decide the presidential election. So the Electoral College, I think, uh, would be my answer and something that I'm I'm thinking about maybe uh, writing a similar kind of book, because I think there's also a really rich history when it comes to to the Electoral College as well, not just it, or its origins, but the various different points in U.S. history where it's had a, a profound effect. Fantastic. Do you care, care to speak at all 
directly to the difference between the political representative and those who they represent and why we have the, the, the power struggle that we have relative to drawing lines. Um, I'm not sure I understand the exactly what you're, you're asking. Well, the, the, the idea that people are in charge, they draw the lines. And, and, and we, we, the people, elect those people. So are they representative of who we are? Would you, you it, maybe it's a yes or no answer, and maybe not. If not, if you want to pass, we can go to Richard. Well, I mean, it's, it's more of a philosophical question, I guess. But I mean, in terms of democratic theory, um, that's the ideal. In terms of democratic practice, perhaps <laughs> not to the extent that, that we would like. Right. So the next question, and I'm not going to ask it, is what do we do? And you've tried to describe that in your book. So let's go to Richard. Uh, yeah, that's a, this is actually in that connection as well. You laid out a two-step process to try to, to make these changes. I'm curious, uh, has this happened in America anywhere? And if so, does it need some kind of American oligarch uh, in these days of Citizens United to, to, to be behind this process to help fund the kind of that kind of change in, in a statewide system i think i think so yes um if there was one billionaire out there who made fixing gerrymandering kind of the focus of his or her attention and fortune i think we could we could make an awful lot of progress um there are certainly groups who work on this but they tend to be groups that focus on lawsuits. There's no shortage of lawsuits being filed regarding districts all over the country at, at all times. Uh, but uh, for reasons that I, I, I touched on, I kind of see lawsuits as being a not especially effective tool at mm -hmm. bringing about certainly permanent change, but even in, in, in the short term, uh, lawsuits are kind of hit and miss. Uh, I think we should be devoting less attention to lawsuits and more to activism of the kind that, I, that I've talked about in, in some of my previous answers. But yeah, if Mark Zuckerberg or uh, Jeff Bezos or uh, Elon Musk has other things going on right now, but if one of those wants to, <laughs> to give me a billion dollars, I could, I could do a, a, a lot to, to, to fix this problem. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right. All right. So Fred, Fred, you're I, up. I, I just like to really remind everyone that we are having the uh, the, the book club on uh, November fifth from uh, uh, the, the the main bars from three to four at the Barnes Noble and uh, Ma Ma Mandarin. If uh, and, and Nick is able to show up, I really enjoy that, and uh, you know, looking forward to seeing everyone there that's able, able, able to make it. Not yeah, I will. Though. I will certainly try to uh, to to make an appearance at the book club. I'll have to check my schedule, but I, I yeah, I would I would like to to join you at least for some of the time. Thank 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 you very much. And that, that's all all that I had. All right. Let's say we went back in the in the music in the music section of Barnes and Nobles. Right, in the back in the music section of Barnes and Nobles. Um, so, anybody else have any other comments or com questions for for um, Nick? Every everybody, are you satisfied with the idea that this is what we're living with? This is Jerry. We got gerrymandering. We've we've got manipulations. I I, I do have. If if you're willing to. Indulge me, Nick. I do have a question that that goes be a little bit beyond gerrymandering, but it involves the manipulation of votes. And the manipulation of votes is not new, as you describe in your book. We've been manipulating votes even before we had the term gerrymandering, and we continue to do it. 
we continue to manipulate votes. From your experience, relative to the uh, electronic voting machines, where one vote is cast by one person and then goes into this electronic machine that then processes the vote, is that a potential for disaster in relative to voting manipulation? We've had lawsuits about it. We've had all sorts of, and here's what, here's what I'm saying. The idea is that the software for the electronic voting machines is proprietary. You, you can't look at it and you can't verify it. So once the vote hits the machine, how can we be certain that that vote is accurately counted? So I think I think that's a fair point. Now, I'm not aware of any instances where that technology has been hacked or manipulated in, in any significant way. But I do agree that as everything becomes more interconnected, uh, it's it's something that we have to be concerned with. At the very least, the machines that are being used should produce a paper backup that's not in a line of code. It, you put your vote in, it prints out a receipt, and you can see you've got some kind of paper confirmation that your vote has gone in, it's been recorded accurately. Um, I'm not a fan of the machines, particularly the machines where there's no physical ballot whatsoever, where you just vote and it goes into a hard drive somewhere and then the numbers get read off at the uh, at the end of the night. Um, I do think that there, there are ways that we can leverage technology to make elections more efficient, not as expensive, but there always has to be some kind of physical record that cannot be manipulated. So at the very least, you can go back and look and say, we have these pieces of paper, we can audit the result, we can do a recount. It's not just an election that exists as lines of code, there's something on paper that we can review. I do think some states have gone too far in the direction of technology. And when everything is done on a touch screen or, or in a computer, I think you are increasing the possibility that something could be manipulated either externally through some kind of hack or even from some some election official who maybe is on the take and is uh, is changing the results as well. Well, thank you for your answer. I appreciate that, David. Uh, once again, I agree uh, totally with what Nick said, but I wanted to point out another uh, flip side of that. Uh, and I am in no way defending the uh, current regime in Venezuela, but when the United States under the Bush administration, Republican administration, was trying to put the hammer on Venezuela and demanding uh, fair elections and demanding that there be outside observers, one of the demands that they made was precisely what Nick said, that you will not only have the machines that you're going to be using, but you will have the paper trail as well at the same time that Republicans in the United States were trying to get away from having to have the paper trail. So they were insisting on it for Venezuela and trying to get away from it in the United States. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can have double standards any which way. So, you know, uh, you got you just have to be <laughs> alert because uh, politicians are always going to come up with new and better ways to keep themselves in power. Yeah. Nick, care to comment? No, that, that Schwamberg guy, he knows his stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, but that, but that's the point we we were making. Or I was trying to make earlier is what's the difference between a politician and the average individual who wants to be a politician, who wants to have that kind of control? The, you know, the politicians are supposedly representative of their constituents. 
Do you feel that's true? I think some are. Um, what's the saying? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Lord, Lord Acton. Mm -hmm. I think I actually quoted that in the in the book. Uh, not actually not that one, but uh, another quote by uh, by him. Um, it, it's a good question, and I don't know that there's a an easy solution other than just for people to pay more attention to to the types of people that represent them and meet the candidates. Go attend the the forums. I think you get a much better sense of someone when you have the opportunity to see them talk in person, have the opportunity to ask them questions. If more people were engaged in politics and really scrutinizing their elector their elected officials, I think we would have fewer politicians who get corrupted by the power of office and more politicians who actually do act as, as representatives. Now, I don't think you can ever eliminate the fact that the power might go to, to their head, they may still pay more attention to their own interests as opposed to the interests of the people they purportedly represent. Um, but ultimately, that's that's our job as as citizens is to exercise the franchise responsibly and to hold our elected officials accountable. And I don't think we do a good enough job of that uh, in in our modern society. Um, well, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> I don't think we do a good enough job of it. And I don't know how to do a better job. I actually don't know. Because we, at least I try to do the best I know how. And it's not good enough. So, at least from my perspective. So, at any rate, Nick, I have very, Dr. Seabrook, I so much appreciate you and everybody you can unmute your mics now and uh, and just let's say thank you and appreciate Nick because we've come to our end of our time. We've, he's give, Nick has given us two hours and we, I can't think of anybody better than Nick Seabrook to talk about gerrymandering and all the other stuff that we've asked him about. So thank you, Nick. And I wish you the best. Look forward to your next piece of work. And and I'm so happy you are someone in charge of, over there at UNF. You're, you're doing a great job. Um, so I thank you, Madeline. Nick, we're getting ready to close out. Do you want to you want to you want to summarize anything? Ah, uh, well, I think I've said uh, a lot of stuff or about a lot of things. So I will just say thank you to everybody for for coming along. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, and I hope you check out the the book. You, yes, and we are checking out the book and we I personally find find this fascinating. And I thank you for your time, your wisdom and your insights and, and everything that you've given us this evening. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, David, oh, you, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, speaking of elections, you were going to say something about nominations for uh, for, the, uh, for the Free Coast, Free Thought Society. We we have a few more weeks oh. for people to nominate. Uh, oh, you're talking. Oh, yeah, Ken. I'm talking to Ken, not Nick. <laughs> Unless he wants to join the Free Thought Society. I, I, I thought you know. Nick was going to talk about our gerrymandering process relative to <laughs> elections in, in the free thought society but that's not what you No, it's not gerrymandering i get to choose all the candidates that's not gerrymandering that's a different system oh my god yeah all right all right i see so uh, listen if you're interested well david why don't you do it Okay, uh, we do have elections in November. We are going to be uh, electing officers and board members for the coming year. Officers are board members. Uh, we have president, vice president, uh, treasurer, and secretary. Uh, and in addition, I think there are three other board members, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we can. Pardon? 
Mem members at large. Members at large on the board. Uh, we can have more members at large. Uh, all of the officers from this past year are going to be on the ballot for the coming year. But if you are interested uh, either in nominating somebody for one of the positions or perhaps nominating yourself uh, to be a member of the board, uh, you still have time. You can email me or email Ken uh, in order to uh, have your name put on the ballot. But the voting will be sent out electronically in November, and we will announce the results of the election in December at the uh, uh, Dinner of Lights, or whatever we're calling it. So, Perfect. did I, did I say you. it right? Okay. Yeah, I couldn't have said it. I, you did it much better than I could have ever done it. I, I, so thank you for that, David. And it's all true. We're looking for people to get involved with the organization. And we've been around 25 years and uh, we'll be around hopefully maybe another 25 years. But in the meantime, there's a book, One Person, One vo Vote, Nicholas Seabrook. He's been our guest tonight and we very much appreciate your time, Dr. Seabrook. And Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. We're it's time to say good night. And Madeline, you're in charge of the shutting us all down. <laughs> Thank you, Have Madeline. a good night. <laughs> good night. Thanks.